Uh, hi, thanks everyone for logging in to uh, this CBI. Who am I? So I'm Adriana Robertson. I am presently in Toronto, uh, Canada. Why am I doing a CBI from Toronto, Canada? Well, uh, I spent the autumn quarter at the law school teaching financial regulation and Professor Levmore asked if I'd be interested in doing a virtual CBI uh, given that everybody's doing everything online, it really doesn't so much matter that I'm no longer actually in the city of Chicago. So I'm happy to do it. Uh, should be a lot of fun. So here is what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to start by just talking a little bit about why I picked this paper of all the papers that I could have picked. Then what I'll do is tell you just a little bit, I don't know if you had a chance to read the paper, uh, but if you haven't, I'll just tell you a little bit about the paper kind of in a nutshell. And then finally, what I'd like to do is talk about how the paper looks today. Right? So uh, it was published in 1989, so the paper's as old as I am. And so it's kind of interesting, I think, to think about uh, how it stacks up over time. So if at any point you just want to jump in and uh, you know, chat, ask a question, make a remark, by all means, uh, please do so. If not, I'm thinking you know, this will probably take like 20, 30 minutes and we can then have an open discussion at the end, okay? All right, so why this paper? I think it's fair to say that uh, Easterbrook and Fischel, the corporate contract has become really almost part of the furniture when we think about the law of corporations or business associations, or even really kind of business law generally. So it's, it's quite canonical at this point. I will say that it, it's kind of hard to pick just one paper of theirs. Easterbrook and Fischel were prolific, um, and they, particularly as it relates to corporate law, uh, they wrote a lot. And it's kind of hard to sort of tear them apart. So what I did was I picked this particular piece because, I think it does a nice job of laying out in broad strokes their approach uh, to the question. And as it turns out, a lightly modified version of this paper ended up being the introduction to uh, this book, right? uh, The Economic Structure of Corporate Law, which I highly recommend. Uh, what this book does is it sort of pulls together their thinking on a wide variety of issues related to the law of corporations. And so you can think of this paper as sort of laying out broadly speaking, their approach. And again, just to be very clear, uh, the paper is about much more than just corporate law. Right? When we think about corporate law, I think typically what we have in mind is Delaware law of sort of duty of care, duty of loyalty, Revlon, how we think about M&A and all that kind of stuff. And all of that's very important. But what we're interested in here is sort of the law governing corporations much more broadly. So this could have to do with securities. It could have to do with raising debt. It could have to do with having employees, right? All of these things are part of, sort of broadly the law of corporations. And so what is a corporation as Easterbrook and Fischel conceive of it? Well, it's just a financing device. It's just a particular way to arrange your affairs. And so, Based on that, right, we can sort of take a step back and say, what is this paper in a nutshell? Right? So the title of the paper, The Corporate Contract, and there's two basic premises in the paper, although they're not spelled out right at the very beginning, you kind of find them uh, later in the paper. The first is that, as I said, uh, the corporation is just a financing device. And a contract, as they say later in the paper, a contract is just a voluntary arrangement. So what do we get if we put these two things together? Right? Well, the law of corporations then is just the rules that govern voluntary arrangements related to financing cooperative ventures. Okay? And then the question is, how should we think about these arrangements? And how should we think about how they ought to be governed? Right? So uh, the key features of the paper uh, we've got a couple on the slide here, but really most of it is baked into the first one. Because the, the main thrust of the whole Easterbrook and Fischel philosophy of corporate law and corporations is that sophisticated parties aren't going to agree to something that's not in their interest. Right? And so the starting point is, I think really quite elegantly put, 
Uh, look, corporations don't just appear as they are in their present state. Like ExxonMobil didn't just wake up one day as it is. Right? And so there's this great quote from the paper. It's on page 419, I think. Uh, Managers and investors do not wake up in this way. They assume their roles with knowledge of the consequences. Investors part with their money willingly, putting dollars in equities instead of bonds or banks or land or gold because they believe the returns of equities are more attractive. Managers obtain their positions after much trouble and toil, competing against others who wanted them. All interested persons participate. Firms are born small and grow. They must attract customers and investors by promising and delivering what those people value. Corporations that do not do this will not survive. When people observe that firms are very large and related to, in relation to single investors, they observe the product of success in satisfying investors and customers. Right? So, I mean, it seems entirely obvious, uh, but it's actually still worth pointing out because notwithstanding the fact that it's completely obvious once somebody puts that in front of you, uh, we somehow seem to forget about it. And certainly the conversation around corporations had very much not thought of it that way uh, back in 1989 when this paper was published. And so given that we're talking about sophisticated parties, we also need to think in terms of substance, right? Because that's what matters, not the label you slap on things, uh, but what's actually going on. And so one way to think about it, as they talk about in the paper, is that everything is just a product, right? including corporate governance. Corporate governance is a product that people are getting. Uh, debt contracts, that's just a product that people are getting, including all of the pieces that go into that product. Right? Employment relationships, those are just a product. Right? So we don't tear them apart and look at them piece by piece. We think of the whole product, just as you know, when you go out and buy a bicycle, you're not focused just on the seat of the bicycle. You're focused on how it works as a package. And well, similarly, uh, when we think about corporate governance, we're not interested in just one piece, we're interested in how it works as a package. And we can also put a different label on it. So at another point in the paper, Easterbrook and Fischel say, well, the separation of risk bearing from employment, right, the separation of ownership and sort of control, in other words, that's just a form of division of labor, they say. So we can also think of it as labor. And they also sort of say that Everything's a contract, right? Because after all, a contract is just a voluntary arrangement. So any voluntary arrangement is a contract, right? So they break everything down, in other words, to fundamentals, right? Everything's a product, everything is labor, everything's a contract. And so what's really amazing to me in going back to this paper is that you have these two deeply, deeply institutionally focused scholars, right? I think it's Nobody would say that these are the kind of law and economic scholars that don't really care about institutional details. They absolutely do. But notwithstanding this, uh, they're willing to abstract away from legal institutions completely when it's useful to their theory. And so what you find, at least what I found, the most important sensation in some sense of reading through the paper again today is this sensation of zooming in uh, zooming out and zooming back in again, right? So we care about the details, we step back, we see the big picture, and then we go back to the details. The second key feature as I see it uh, in thinking about this paper is a strong resistance to what I like to call anecdata um, and generalizations, right? Both of these things. So what do I mean when I say anecdata? Uh, that's the term I like to use for, well, you know, there's this one example of a corporation that did X, Y, and Z, and it was really bad. And so I think we all know that one observation does not data make, uh, but notwithstanding this, there's a, a strong tendency to do so. And they push back against that uh, quite forcefully. But at the same time, they also don't believe in these broad brush generalizations. And so what do I mean by that? Well, for example, uh, we can't speak in these really sweeping statements, they argue, about what is good or bad for a company, right? Because each company is different, and what's good for one may not be right for another. And again, it seems sort of totally obvious when somebody says it, and yet, certainly at the time the paper was written, uh, this was not an uncontroversial statement. And there are other trade-offs, of course, as well. Uh, one example, 
right? Internal production, what does that mean? Uh, doing everything in-house, right? A corporation could do everything in-house or it could contract pieces out, right? And so the benefit of doing things in-house is you can control the operation, things can be more streamlined, you don't have to hire external people and maybe worry about the fact that they're not gonna show up. But at the same time, internal production has its own costs, right? It's really hard to assign prices to things. Uh, you run into all sorts of trouble around growing bureaucracies. And so costs can sometimes start to spiral or quality can start to fall. Right? So again, uh, this is a trade-off. And so what we end up seeing when we just look out into the world at a way a, a corporation is set up is an equilibrium. Whatever happened to work for that particular firm. Right. And so, uh, for example, again, the authors say, uh, the firm grows until the costs of organizing production internally exceed the costs of organizing things through market transactions. And the best choice, given that you have to make that trade-off, will occur at different points for different firms. Right? And so as a result, these broad generalizations, they just don't work. But at the same time, we also don't want to say, well, you know, there's one example of one firm somewhere in Vermont that did this. You know, that's kind of anecdata. That's not terribly persuasive either. And, uh, last piece, I think that's sort of critical to the way the argument in the paper is laid out, is this recognition of and focus on what I would call the second best. And so what do I mean by that? We're not interested in what is theoretically the perfect setup. Right, that, that sort of optimal approach uh, to anything. Right, what we're interested in is what is the best thing we could come up with under the circumstances, or maybe even more precisely, relative to the other options that were available. Right, so we're not looking for the best. The question that we're, sh we're asking is not, is this the best possible way to structure relationships? It's, can you think of a better one? And those are two very different questions. And then, you know, putting this all together, towards the end of the paper, they have this great discussion where they totally dismiss some of these, this old chestnut uh, that was popular then and incidentally keeps coming up today of, you know, what is the goal of the corporation? Right? Or as they put it, maximans. What is the thing that the corporation is trying to maximize? Right? Is it short run profits? Is it long run profits? Is it social welfare? Is it something else entirely? And so that's a question, big then. And they just dismiss it out of hand. And they literally say, who cares? Why do they do that? Well, if you start from the premise that people went into this arrangement voluntarily and eyes wide open, then as they put it, who is anyone else to judge the situation? So they give this example of the New York Times. The New York Times in its reporting wants to leave money on the table as it were, right? not sort of maximize profits because they're interested in achieving other goals as well. Who's anyone else to judge, right? Assuming, and this is a big assumption and a big caveat, that that was the deal all along, right? That everybody knew that the New York Times was gonna leave money on the table. Right? If that's the case, then, Who's anyone else to say that they're doing something wrong uh, if they do so? And so this to me is uh, one of those wonderful, everything that's old is new again kind of situations. Because right? uh, some of you may have heard about the business roundtable last, I guess it was August now, uh, feels like a lifetime ago, right? on the role of the corporation and this discussion about stakeholders. Right? So this again, this is like six months ago. There was this redefining the purpose of the corporation uh, to promote an economy that serves all Americans. Now, whether this is just cheap talk or whether there's actually something behind it is a bit of an open question. But I think what it certainly does is it illustrates the timelessness of this question of what is the corporate purpose? What are they trying to maximize? And again, I think Easterbrook and Fischel, at least in this particular paper, would probably say something like, who cares? I just don't change the rules midstream. So, so that's one thing that you know, we've already hinted at something that's sort of come back around, uh, but there's been three big developments in the last you know, 31 years since the paper was published. 
that I think are really, really important and really useful uh, for thinking about the paper today. So the first is the behavioral revolution, right? So this, in the late 80s, uh, behavioral finance wasn't really a thing. It didn't really come into its own until about the 2000s or so. And so how does the paper look in the context of the intervening research there? The rise of intermediaries, right? So uh, they were important then, certainly, but they've become even more important now. And then finally, and I think probably most significantly, the rise of index investing, large asset managers, the so-called passive revolution, uh, these sort of large block holders, large cross holders, which I think it's fair to say is probably the single most significant development in the capital markets in the last couple of decades. And so what I'd like to do then is think about, you know, and I'd love to chat with you uh, about how the paper stacks up in light of these things. Now, just to be fair, um, it's kind of an unfair question to ask, right? Because after all, how on earth were they to know that 31 years later, things would have changed in the world, right? So uh, just to be very clear, to the extent that it doesn't line up particularly well, it's not necessarily a criticism of the authors. Uh, but on the other hand, this is also not about asking them to predict the future per se, because the paper is, is a theoretical paper. And so the question is, how does the theory look? given the way the world has changed. My guess would be that Easterbrook and Fischel wouldn't think that their theory was any less applicable 30 years before they published the paper. And so how does it pan out 30 years after they published the paper? Right, that's how I think about it. So I will start with uh, the behavioral revolution, as I called it here. Uh, so the paper leans quite heavily on the efficient market hypothesis. And if you read the paper, uh, you might have gotten a, a flavor, I certainly did, that it sounds a little Panglossian today. Uh, sort of everything is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Uh, prices can't be wrong because prices are right. And so what could possibly go wrong? Right? In other words, they lean quite heavily on the efficient market hypothesis. And so what is that, just to remind everyone? Well, the idea of the efficient market hypothesis is that you know, suppose there's some stock trading in the market and it's undervalued, right? It's worth more than the market price. Well, the idea goes that if that were true, then some arbitrageur would snap it up, right? you'd buy it. And of course, because people would be buying it, supply and demand would push up the price. And similarly, if something were, un, were overpriced, right, if it were the case that, you know, it's not actually worth what it's trading for, well, then people are going to sell it, right? Either people who own it will sell it, or somebody who doesn't already own it will short it, right? You know, price is going to come down, and so eventually uh, the market price will be correct. And of course, if you really strongly believe in the efficient market hypothesis, that eventually is instantaneous. Right? So the prices are never wrong, right? Prices are always right. Everything is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. And, and this is the part where uh, things get even more important for the, the paper. It doesn't even matter if I don't know what the correct price should be, right? because as long as somebody knows the correct price, then they're gonna be the one uh, to do the buying and selling, and I can just benefit from that correct price. Right? And so, how does this work out in the context of the paper? Well, one example they talk about is uh, the terms of the corporate contract. Right? So, let's suppose that some governance term uh, is really undesirable to investors, like, say, non-voting shares. Right? Well, if non-voting shares are really harmful to investors, then you know, the market's just going to price them. And even if I don't know what the correct discount is for non-voting shares, some sophisticated investor does, and that sophisticated investor is going to come uh, and bid the price down, and then I just get to free ride on that sophisticated investor's expertise. Right? So as a result of this, uh, retail investors are protected by the professional investors, right? And of course, investors won't be systematically fooled, right? They're going to know, at least the, the big professional guys, they're going to know what the correct price of this governance term is. 
And so they say in the paper, uh, turns out to be hard to find any interesting item that does not have influence on price. Now, one thing I would just note that certainly has changed just empirically since the late 80s is that it's now easier and cheaper for Americans to be retail investors than ever before. And so there's almost certainly going to be more of these so-called noise traders or unsophisticated retail investors, uh, particularly in some segments of the market. This is sort of a well-known phenomenon. So uh, how does this paper look today? Well, I think at this point, we all know that there are substantial inefficiencies in financial markets. So this idea that prices are right, we can always rely on them. I think we know that's no longer true. Well, not that it's no longer true. We know that's not true now. Right? So there's this great paper by Lauren Cohen and co-authors called Lazy Prices. Basically, it turns out that investors are inattentive to corporate filings. Uh, there's another one by Sam Hartsmark, who's over at Booth, uh, reconsidering returns. Right? Basically, you find these systematic, clear mistakes that are priced. And even professional corporate managers make systematic mistakes. So Ulrike Melmendier has some great work uh, with different co-authors looking at, you know, CEO behavior and finding that they also have these behavioral biases that lead to uh, problematic behavior in financial markets. Right. So we know that markets can be efficient today in a way that I don't think was really discussed in polite conversation back in the 80s. Right? Uh, so, so what does the paper then do? How do we think about it? Well, you know, maybe we'd walk some of this back, uh, certainly in terms of the way the argument is presented, it's a bit jarring. I mean, there were points in time when I was reading this, okay, gosh, okay, I don't think you would say it quite like that today. Uh, you would add a bunch more caveats, but on balance, the argument probably still holds up, notwithstanding this change in uh, the academic literature. Right, so I think certainly if you went over to you know, the business school, people will tell you about all these inefficiencies and all the errors people make. Uh, and yet, and yet, as a baseline, I think in the end, it's probably everybody's prior that markets work basically most of the time. Right? And on top of that, and if we add in the fact that Easterbrook and Fischel are primarily interested in this question of the second best, right, or what are the alternatives, it's really not clear that we have anything better, right? And in fact, the authors kind of acknowledge this uh, in the paper itself, right? So they say, if professional investors with their fortunes on the line are unable to anticipate the true effects of non-voting stock or some other wrinkle in a corporate case, how are members of state legislatures or other alternative rule givers to do better? To put this differently, it does not matter if markets are not perfectly efficient unless some other social institution does better at evaluating the likely effects of corporate governance devices. The prices will be more informative than the next best alternative, which is all anyone can demand of any device. And so I think that part still basically holds. And to the extent then that the paper feels a bit jarring in the way it characterizes this push on uh, efficient markets and sort of uh, price mechanisms, uh, that might be more framing than substance. It's overall holds up pretty well. What about intermediaries? And so Easterbrook and Fischel in the paper recognize the role of intermediaries. They talk about stock market, unions, headhunters, those are both on sort of the employment side, bond trustees, banks on the debt side, pension fund managers, uh, mutual funds, that's on the sort of equity market side. They talk about regulation, and they also talk about externalities. Right? And so, for example, they talk about securities disclosure and how, while it's useful to investors, it also can potentially give away some information to competitors. And as a result, a corporation may be unwilling to uh, make disclosures on its own, right? not because they want to hide it from their investors, but rather because they don't want their competitors to see it. And so because of that externality, right, the regulators can come in and maybe fix that logjam. 
Right? That's the externality they have in mind when they think about regulation. Of course, what's interesting is in today's context, we often think about a completely different externality, which in this context, it's a positive externality and it accrues to the benefit of investors in other firms potentially. So for example, uh, Jay Clayton, the commissioner of the SEC, recently mentioned an example of this in a call about you know, the latest events around the coronavirus and everything that it's done to the economy and, and corporations recently. So there's a big question. This is not, this is, if you think about it, kind of obvious. What does it mean for companies to make uh, material disclosures and what is materiality in the context of the coronavirus pandemic and all of the havoc it's wreaking? Uh, so we might think, for example, about disclosures around uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, or you know, health and safety measures, other things that a, a company might be doing in light of the pandemic questions about whether or not it's material. But what's important here is that there's also a really big positive externality from forcing company A to make a disclosure about what kind of PPE and health and safety policies it's engaged in. Uh, it's beneficial for investors in other companies to know that. And it's also potentially beneficial for just the rest of society, like maybe your customers care. And so that's a broader notion of this sort of externality that the intermediary, the regulator creates. And so I think here, how does it look today? Uh, they look kind of prescient. If anything, maybe they didn't actually go quite far enough because if anything, they sort of understate the importance of these intermediaries and these other institutions. Maybe it's not even the corporate contract at all. Maybe it's the corporate ecosystem. Uh, and the same is true with law, incidentally. By and large, people aren't sort of corporate law scholars or corporate law people, uh, even if we call them that as a shorthand, right? Because corporate and securities certainly are linked in a way that makes it almost impossible to separate them. And then financial regulation gets thrown in there. Right? So we've got this much more complicated bundling. And so if anything, uh, you'd wanna push this even further the role of intermediaries in thinking about this, the corporate ecosystem, perhaps. Okay, what about the last one? Uh, this is the one that I think is the most interesting. There's a lot of talk in the paper about the role of diversified investors. And right? you talk about, for example, uh, an investor doesn't care about the performance of a single particular firm if she's diversified. And then all she wants to do is maximize the average performance of the firms in her portfolio because she just cares about what she gets overall. And so they talk about this, Easterbrook and Fischel, in the specific context of M&A. Right? So they talk about takeover premium. So if I don't know if I'm gonna be the buyer or the seller, then I don't really care. And if I know I'm both the buyer and the seller, right? I own a stake in both, well, I don't really care what the takeover premium is, right? Because I'm just handing money from one pocket to the other. It's all the same to me. They also have this really great example where they talk about uh, bidding on an FCC license. And so they talk about how, suppose we have this license worth a million dollars and there are 10 firms in the running. Each one might spend, say, $50,000 uh, trying to get that license, right? Maybe on lawyers, on market surveys, maybe lobbying, whatever you want to call it. And so times 10 firms, that's $500,000. But of course, if one person owned all 10 of those firms, or if, if one person is equally invested in all 10 of those firms, then she doesn't care right, which company, which of the 10 gets the license. Uh, she just wants it to go to whichever one's going to use it most efficiently, and she wants to spend no money on lobbying. Right? So uh, Easterbrook and Michelle distinguish between what's privately beneficial for the firm, what's socially beneficial, what's kind of best overall, and what's beneficial to a diversified shareholder. Right? And in this particular example of this FCC license, uh, what's socially optimal and what's optimal to the, the crossholder are the same. So how does this look? Well, here, uh, this conversation starts to sound really eerily prescient, right? 
this is if you've been following at all the debate about you know, the anti-competitive effects of cross ownership or you know index investing is marxist or all that fun stuff uh, this starts to sound really 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 familiar and so as i went back and read the paper i was sort of blown away by just how familiar some of it sounded now of course there are differences right Easterbrook and Fischel are not talking about product markets, but we could think about product markets, right? So what do I mean when I talk about anti-competitive uh, cross holdings? Well, this is that famous airline paper, right? It turns out that maybe uh, if I own all the airlines, then I don't really want those airlines to compete too much. I'd rather they kind of raise prices because then after all, uh, I don't care which of the airlines gets the business, I own them all. And so maybe I want them to act a little bit more like a monopolist uh, than like really competitive firms. Okay. So what does socially optimal mean then in this context? Presumably it's not just what's profit maximizing for the airline industry. And so how do we think about this argument? Well, it's gonna depend on who the investor is. So let's taking their framework to this current debate, right? if we assume that the investors are on average also consumers, well then maybe we don't actually care right, what they're doing. If investors are on average disproportionately likely to be consumers, well then they might actually wanna undercharge. Right? If my investors are flying more than the average then in fact, maybe I wanna charge really low prices because yeah, there's lower profits, but you know the, the shareholders make it up when they actually fly. But then of course, if an investor knows that, well then why would someone who isn't a disproportionate consumer invest in an airline? Right? But then of course, if only the disproportionate users invest, well then they lose diversification and everything starts to fall apart, right? So what's the equilibrium here? Uh, it's kind of a, a fun thought experiment to work through. And so I don't think there's an easy answer necessarily, uh, but what I do think is that Easterbrook and Fischel invite us to think about the question very broadly. Okay. A couple of things, for example, we would take from the paper is, you know, why do we think that the corporations won't come to the best solution on their own? Why are we fussing around with the best? Uh, maybe what we should be thinking about instead is compared to what? Right? Or what's the best thing we could do under the circumstances? Or do you have a better solution? Right? Which is a, a very, very different thing. So, uh, so with that, you know, I'm kind of done. I'm happy to chat. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen because there's nothing to show you here. But you know, I would love to just chat uh, to the extent that anybody wants to. So I see a hand up. Uh, I'm gonna unmute you this time. Oh, I lost you, you put your hand down. Uh, but why don't you just unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Hello, uh, Adriana. My name is Isaac. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us this talk. Uh, my question is more about the uh, corporation purpose. What is the purpose of the corporation? Do you think that the is it just maximizing um, uh, the uh, money for shareholders? Do you think that this uh, perspective that they show in their book is currently the, the right one in what we see in the world? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so in fact, it's interesting, their view of this specific question, what is the purpose of the corporation, is literally who cares. Uh, so they don't actually think that it's for anyone, it's basically irrelevant. Uh, why is it irrelevant? Because again, from their perspective, corporation is just a way to finance a project. Uh, it's a way to finance some kind of cooperative activity. And so one goal could be uh, maximize profits for shareholders, but they make it quite clear that if it's the case that, you know, the goal here is actually something else, something besides maximizing profits, that's completely fine. Right? So they give that example of the New York Times, right? If I want to set up a company and it says right in the charter that I'm going to donate 50% of all profits uh, to, you know, the World Health Organization so that it can spend it on things, I think Easterbrook and Fischel would say, that's fine, do that. I think the only time it would become problematic would be if I set up a corporation saying, I'm gonna give 100% of the profits to shareholders, and then after collecting their money, decided to change the rules midstream. 
right? So what's interesting is they just basically sidestep this entire debate. Right? They don't think it's really all that interesting. Uh, their view is more, you tell me what you want to do, right? and then we'll just think about how you set up doing it. Thank you so much. Professor Robertson, this is uh, Ethan here from your wonderful class in the autumn. Um, Hello. I have, a, I have a question for you, kind of a hypothetical. You talked about some of the intervening developments since this paper was published. Um, I guess kind of related to the, the last question, we've seen proposals in the US from people on the, the Democratic side running for president regarding you know, mandatory stock ownership by employees and other types of things like that, um, essentially to bring these other, you know, shareholders into like actual shareholding in, like in the corporation or yeah, stakeholders into shareholders. Um, that would seem to have a pretty big, if, if those plans actually, you know, were to, to become effective, uh, that would seem to have kind of a detrimental effect on Easterbrook's idea here. So I was just wondering if you'd, you'd touch on that maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I think you're right. Uh, in particular, the biggest hit that would be taken, again, just given the discussion in this particular paper, is the diversification side, right? So if all of a sudden uh, a huge chunk of the ownership lies with the, sh the workers, for example, employees, uh, well, employees already have a huge chunk of their human capital tied up in the company. They may also have a chunk of their retirement, depending on whether or not you know, they still have a pension or uh, whatever, or if they're getting uh, employee stock, right? All sorts of different ways that employees might have their wealth tied up in the company. And then on top of that, uh, if you're also forcing them to own it through you know, these various proposals, then what you're essentially doing is you know, reducing the ability to diversify. And so if you kind of think that through, again, based on their approach, um, well, that means those shares are less valuable to those particular investors, right? Because they can't diversify. And so uh, it's worth less to someone who can't hold a, a diversified portfolio. And as a result, it kind of means that those guys are subsidizing everybody else, uh, which is a very odd approach to take. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it runs into a pretty serious problem given the argument in the paper and also just given sort of modern capital markets theory, I would have a hard time believing that Easterbrook or Fischel would support uh, such a proposal. I will say it is the norm in other parts of the world, right? So Germany uh, has these sort of workers councils and they're involved in running the company, but it's very different from American traditional corporate organization. Awesome, thank you so much. And thanks for uh, coming back to give this talk. Oh, you're welcome. I think you're on mute. Professor Robertson, I want to jump in for another question. If the cooperation is a nexus of contracts, why we should uh, prioritize the contract between the shareholders and not the contract with the employees or the contract with its uh, uh, suppliers or other contracts with communities outside the realm of the cooperation? Yeah, so when you say prioritize, what do you have in mind there? I mean, if, if they clash or if there's uh, some kind of a conflict between different interests. So the question, usually the question is that, you know, the shareholders uh, interest trumps all in other interests, mostly unless there's some kind of fraud or, um, uh, or uh, I can't think of another, um, another idea, but 
why not it's it's contract with its employees or with suppliers or other contractors that have business with the corporation uh maybe that's the most important thing that it should um uh push push forward right so you know what makes the the shareholders so sacrosanct if this is all just you know who cares uh, because that's kind of their view right it's all just kind of who cares so why should why should anyone be sacrosanct so i think one thing i would say to that is it's not clear to me that the shareholders do always come first in fact to the extent that you have suppliers and you have unpaid obligations to your suppliers that's debt and that gets paid before your shareholders get paid right so it's not actually true that every time there's a a tension between the two the shareholders always win because you have to pay your suppliers before you can pay your shareholders because uh, that's a debt claim and if you don't and you go bankrupt well then uh, you're gonna get in serious trouble for having made a dividend payment right that's gonna get clawed back uh, it's gonna go to your suppliers right the same is true for your employees to the extent that you have uh, you know wage claims that's that's a debt claim right so the shareholders are not getting paid before some of these other guys right but I think what you're getting at is this question of, well, why is it that, you know, it's only the, the shareholders that vote, for example, because that part is true, right? So the board is selected by shareholders. Uh, and yes, it's possible, I suppose, for a, a large supplier to also be a shareholder, but in general, they're not. Right? And so I think the general rationale is, and this is not really in this particular paper, but it's more broadly, the argument goes something like this. Uh, we have incomplete contracting. We know contracts are incomplete. And so what we'd like to do, again, we're in a world of the second best. Right? So we're just trying to come up with the best we can under the circumstances. And it's much easier to write a contract that sort of specifies what your suppliers get. Right? It's just sort of, a, it's basically money, right? Money and a date. It's much easier to specify what your employees get. It's basically what's their wage, what are the terms of their employment, plus we've got all sorts of regulation uh, that kind of deals with some of the health and safety stuff. But it's really hard to specify a contract about actually running the company, right? So we kind of think that that's the contract that's gonna be the most incomplete. And so because of that, because it's really hard to write a contract, we'll instead say, okay, they get to decide. Right? Everybody else can more easily protect themselves with contract, uh, but the shareholders is really hard. So it's just more efficient uh, to let the shareholders be the ones that you know, make the decisions. We protect everyone else with contract. And of course we recognize that, you know, to the extent that that leaves those other parties somewhat unprotected, they're just gonna charge more. Right, that goes back to the original argument, which is corporations don't wake up this way. Right? We had to get people to agree to this. And so to the extent that creditors, for example, think, well, you know, I have this contractual protection, right? I'm a lender, but it's not, it's not quite as good as, you know, let's say a fiduciary duty. Uh, well, then they're just gonna charge more. They're gonna say, look, I'll lend to you, subject to the protection of these contracts, but I know that you know you might find a way to harm me and i'm just going to bake it into the price okay. so i think that's sort of the approach the the reasoning that i would take to or that they would probably take to answer that question hi professor i had a question going off of that um what effect if any do you think will occur if businesses start taking the new business roundtable statement seriously um, how do you think that would play into, you know, the discussion and I guess your answer to that previous question? Yeah, so I think it's pretty ambiguous at this point uh, to what extent the business roundtable statement means much of anything. I think my read of the general consensus is it's just cheap talk, right? It's just nice words, uh, doesn't really mean a whole lot. I think if, I think the the problem with changing midstream is very different from the problem up front. I think if somebody were to say, look, I'm gonna create a new company and we're gonna just have very different governance rules. We're only gonna care about you know, maximizing social value, however we define that, and we're not gonna to listen to what shareholders want. We're no longer gonna have shareholder votes. We're gonna have some other mechanism. I don't know, we're gonna use the blockchain. God only knows what we're gonna do. I think that would be problematic. 
given uh, the framework in the paper and, and sort of general uh, framework. Because the money that that company has uh, was basically obtained under a different understanding, right? So I think insofar as the business roundtable statement is at the moment pretty empty, I don't think it changes anything. And I think to the extent that it did start to fundamentally change the way businesses operate, it'd be pretty problematic. Okay, thank you. Can we talk more about how it would be problematic if they if if they started to take the business roundtable seriously? Like, is it just <clears throat> we expect some sort of sudden big price shift if they stop caring about profit first, and and the lost value for shareholders becomes a litigated matter? I think that would be one. I think in general, uh, at least when I think about concerns related to business organizations, there's two problems. There's uh, the static problem, you know, what happens today? And I think that's exactly what you pointed out. All of a sudden, you would go from, if you're a shareholder, owning something under one set of rules. Now, all of a sudden, the thing I own is worth much less. And so tomorrow, if I went to try to sell my share, it, I would get less than I thought. And that's not good. But it, it's kind of like a one-time thing. It's, you know, we can live with it. I think the bigger problem would be the longer-term consequences. Uh, and there's two of those that I could think of. The first would be just next time a company gets formed and needs financing to get off the ground, it's going to be harder to do so because shareholders, well, prospective shareholders, again, because, you know, Exxon is there the way it is today, but the next Exxon, maybe we don't like oil companies, but like the next biotech that's big and creating vaccines, they're very popular today. They're going to have a hard time raising capital. First of all, because we don't really know, and we wouldn't know what this stakeholder framework meant. And there's just no way we could know until we'd had several decades to actually work it out. So more uncertainty, but certainly also just lower value, right? Like I used to be getting more than I'm getting now. So it would be harder for new firms to get financing. And I think that's a problem going forward, given that we know that uh, new firms tend to be pretty big when it comes to innovation. Uh, they also do a lot of hiring. So we kind of like them. And so that would be very bad. And then a potentially even more pernicious consequence would be what I would think of as kind of uh, legal risk or regulatory risk or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the notion that, well, if we change the rules of the game once, we could do it again. And so to the extent that as investors are unhappy with this change. Uh, that's, again, that's kind of baked in once and done. But if they come away from that thinking, okay, I don't know what's gonna happen next, the rules could change again on me. Then that adds even further risk and a further uncertainty and makes it even harder uh, to raise capital. So to me, the bigger problem is not the one-time hit to shareholders. I mean, it would suck for anyone who owns shares, but you know, at the end of the day, who really cares? Uh, the bigger problem is, financing in the future and really bad uncertainty about what the rules are actually going to look like going forward in terms of future changes. Uh, that's to me what I would worry about. Well, I just want to say um, thank you for giving us this talk. It's been very interesting. I know we all enjoyed it. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. You're very welcome. Uh, happy to do it. <laughs>
I can't, I mean, I'm a little impressed, well, I'm little, I'm very impressed. I'm a little amazed that uh, people want to come to lunch talks when there's no lunch. So uh, thank you for, you know, listening to me pontificate about an old paper that's as old as I am. It's been a lot of fun. All right, I know you guys have another uh, class coming up and also my phone is ringing. I snuck into my office today. I wasn't supposed to do that. Um, so I'm gonna head out, uh, but thank you. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>